wicked and there is no hope. How's that for an introduction? I'll say it again just in case you didn't uh, get it through the reverb. You're all wicked and there is no hope. Unless you know Jesus. My name's John and I'm a, a preacher. I live in Michigan. If you live there too, I take it. I'm married to a wonderful lady. We got five kids and uh, this morning over breakfast, my 12-year-old suggested that as the introduction. She said, Dad, just get up there and tell them they're all wicked and there is no hope. I said, perfect. Perfect. This is the message of Romans chapter 1 and 2. That unless you know Jesus, there's no hope. The name of this conference is Follow. And we're going to talk about following Jesus, but if you don't know Jesus, you can't follow Jesus. You can know about Jesus. You can go to a lot of Jesus activities. But unless you know Jesus, unless you know him, there's no hope. John chapter 17, verse 3. Jesus says this. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He was praying, and this was part of his high priestly prayer before he went to the cross. And he laid it out in one sentence. This is eternal life. You know what the key is? You know what the secret of life? Do you know what the meaning of life is? Do you know what the point is? That they may know you. He was speaking to God the Father. The only true God. And that they may know Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You see, there's three groups of people here tonight. Three groups. The first group of people, you know Jesus. You know that you know that you know Jesus. You have a personal relationship with Jesus. You probably talk to him at some point during the day. You may have even heard from him at some point during the day. You know him. You're not just a fan of his on Facebook. You don't just follow his tweets. You don't just, you know, wear a Jesus t-shirt and go to the right church. You know Jesus. I know Jesus. More importantly, Jesus knows me, and I'm real excited about it. That's the first group of people, and I'm sure that there's a ton of us here tonight that know Jesus. There's a second group of people here tonight, and they're the people that don't know Jesus. You don't know Jesus, and to be honest, you're not really interested in getting to know Jesus. I remember being a kid and growing up, going to these things. I, I, I know the drill. Some of you were made to come. Some of you were dragged along. Some of you, your parents said, this is it. You're going to that convention. There's a bunch of groups that got the reserved front row seats. I saw you when the convention started. You reserved the back corner seat for yourself. I saw you. It doesn't mean you don't know Jesus if you're sitting in the back corner seat. Relax. But there's a group of people here that don't know Jesus. But probably the biggest group of people here tonight aren't sure. They don't know if they know Jesus. The most important thing about you is whether or not you know Jesus. It truly defines you. It is the most important thing about you. It's the most important decision that you'll make. That's why right here, the very first night, this is what we're talking about. This is tonight's question. Do you know Jesus? How do you know? How do you know if you know Jesus? I'm going to give you a real simple 
explanation, a formula, if you will. In fact, those of you that write stuff down and you've already got your little convention notebook open and, you know, your youth pastor has given you extra candy and Mountain Dew if you take notes for the small group time later, uh, this is a hint. Write this down, okay? Here's the formula. How do I know if I know Jesus? It's really, really simple. Knowing Jesus equals change. Let me say it again just in case I went too fast. Knowing Jesus equals change. Just so I know that you're alive, because I don't have the cool hair like the group live crew, whatever, okay? I got nothing. I'm 42 white and own a minivan, okay? Just give me a break. Give me a break. I got five children. Four of them are girls. Please pray for me. Say it with me. Knowing Jesus Oh, that was pathetic. Come on, this is the, the national convention. We've been looking forward to it for months. Just say it like you mean it. Say, knowing Jesus, knowing Jesus equals, equals change. change. That's how to know. How do I know if I know Jesus? Has my life changed? You see, you cannot meet Jesus Christ and stay the same. You can't meet Jesus and stay the same way. It's impossible. Through my own life, my own life experience, people that I've met that I know know Jesus, through all the stories of Scripture, you go all through the stories of Scripture, this first group of people that know that they know that they know Jesus, and which, by the way, what we read according to Jesus, that's the secret to eternal life. You want to be saved? You want to be a Christian? You want to know that you know that you know that you're a Christian? you got to know Jesus. Well, you look all throughout Scripture, all these people, they're changed. Everything about them changes. One of my favorite stories in Scripture is the story of a, a short little guy named Zacchaeus, right? And I love him because he was quite evidently below six foot. Well, everyone performing tonight are giants. Did you notice that? I mean, first, the rappers, their hair makes them over six feet tall. The illusionist is a good, I mean, he should be in the NBA, let's be honest. You meet me out in this hallway, and you're going to be like, eh, he's shorter in real life. Hmm. I like Zacchaeus because he's a short guy. Short, I'm taller than this guy. But do, do you guys remember the story of Zacchaeus? Apparently, the way it went is Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming to his town. And the deal was is nobody in Zacchaeus' town really liked him. He was a jerk. He was a thief. He was a tax collector, which even though he was a Jewish guy, the Romans ruled his country at that time, and he kind of sold out. Instead of saying true with the people that he was with, he was basically working for the Romans. And so he would take the tax from the people and give it to the Romans and take the taxes from the people and give it to the Jewish leaders, and then he would take a cut for himself. Tax collectors were known to be thieves. They were corrupt. And so he's a short guy. He's got short man's disease. Nobody likes him. He's a thief and a robber. Jesus is coming to his town, and there's a huge hubbub, a huge crowd. Zacchaeus can't see Jesus. Remember, that this is more than just a veggie tale is what I'm trying to tell you. So he climbs up a tree. Jesus walks into town, sees him. Zacchaeus, you come down because I'm going to your house today. Remember the song? Come on. So he went to his house. And if you read the story in the book of Luke, we, we don't get a whole lot of information except we know that Jesus chose to call Zacchaeus out, chose to go to his house. He had a dinner at the end of the dinner, just hanging out with Jesus, meeting Jesus, getting to know Jesus at the end of the banquet, at the end of the Sunday lunch or brunch or whatever it was that they had. Zacchaeus stands up. And he says, if I have robbed anyone, I will pay it back four times what I owe them. Furthermore, half of everything I own, I'm going to sell and I'm going to give the money to the poor. Zacchaeus totally changed like that. And it wasn't a process. It wasn't a, well, let me see. Let me get to know him a little bit. You know, let me look into his credentials. Let me hang out. You know, I've got some questions. It was instant. It was all or nothing. Zacchaeus met Jesus, and his life changed 
instantly. You go all throughout the scriptures, you see the story after story. Another one of my favorite stories from the New Testament is this guy whose name used to be Saul. Now Saul was a good guy. He was a really, really religious guy. Saul went to church every Sunday. Saul knew the scriptures inside and out. But Saul didn't know Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, you don't know Jack. Saul thought he was honoring God by actually persecuting Christians, people that follow Jesus. Persecuting is a nice word for having them thrown in jail, having them beaten, having them killed. One of the first followers of Jesus was a guy named Stephen. Stephen was stoned to death, and Saul was one of his accusers. In fact, if you read the book of Acts, what we believe is that it says that those that stoned Stephen laid their coats at Saul's feet. That means he was the lead accuser. He had Stephen stoned to death. He was a murderer. He made it his full-time job to be against Jesus. He made it his full-time job to go after anyone who called on the name of Jesus. He was trying to stomp out Christianity. He was trying to stomp out the church. In fact, he was on his way to a city called Damascus to do that very same thing when suddenly, boom, bright light, and a voice from heaven says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's blinded. He's like, oh, what in the world? He says, who are you? I'm Jesus. If you know the story, what happens next is the voice tells him to go to a, a place in that city, and he did. He's blind for three days. He's freaking out. There's a voice from heaven, bright light. The people around him don't know what's going on. God sends another Christian to go lay hands on him and tell him what to do next. And when this guy laid hands on Saul, immediately, it says immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes. You know what the first thing that Saul did? It says he got up and got baptized. Wait, 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 wait. Didn't he start attending youth group for a while? No. Didn't he go to church camp? No. Didn't he go to confirmation class? No. Didn't someone get out the power bracelet with all the, you know, red is for sin and green is for growth and, and, and take him through the four spiritual laws? No. You mean he didn't go through an alpha course? No. Immediately, he submitted his life to the teachings of Jesus, to the teachings of Scripture. It was instant. Because meeting Jesus equals change. Knowing Jesus equals change. How do you know that you know? Has your life changed? You know that Jesus lives in you. You know that Jesus has changed you when everything about you is different from when you knew him before. And the change isn't just one time. It seems like the change keeps on happening. And it happens through this communication that we have with Jesus. About three months ago, I was uh, I'm up in Michigan. And I, I, I had to do a funeral. It's one of those things. That, it's one of the reasons I never wanted to be a preacher. Okay? I, I can, can I just be honest with you? Is that okay? Are you okay with that if I just tell you I never wanted to be a preacher? I never wanted to be a preacher. Look, I can't afford therapy. You're here. Just play along. I never want to be a preacher because I don't want to be funerals, I do funerals because I don't like dead guys. But I did the, this funeral, and at the funeral, I'm meeting a lot of the family for the very first time. I don't, I don't really know this family. They're flying in from all parts of the country, but, you know, I did my best, and it's part of the, the, you know, my duty, and I tried to comfort them as much as I could. And, and the burial for this funeral, it's not even going to be to the next day, and it's a four-hour drive across Michigan. But I just felt like I was supposed to. They were like, you don't have to come to the burial. It's just going to be 15 minutes. We'd like it if you did. And I said, okay, I'll go. And if I'm honest, it's because I, 
I know Jesus, and I think it's something Jesus wanted me to do. And I, I, I can't explain it. I didn't hear a voice. I didn't have, like, you know, this, uh, 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 this fingerprint on the bathroom mirror go across the state to the funeral. It didn't happen like that. It's just because I, because he's my friend. And I felt like Jesus is saying, go to the funeral. I'm like, all right, I'm going to the funeral. I'm, I'm going to the burial. So the next day, I got in my car, and I drove four hours across Michigan. And the whole time, I'm like, why do you want me to go to this thing? You know, and I got there, and I said the little words with the little thing and the Bible, and we did, and everybody hugged, and, oh, thank you for driving, and, oh, look at me, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then, all of a sudden, it became clear. I felt like God was telling me to do something, and to, to be honest, it was really weird. I had this cross around my neck. In fact, it's just like this one, this little wooden cross that somebody gave to me. And when the guy gave it to me, he said, John, I've prayed for you, and I've prayed for that cross, and I've prayed that you'll give it to somebody that just needs that message that, of what this represents. I'm like, okay, awkward. And I wore the cross. And all of a sudden, I'm standing in the cemetery at the side of a grave, and I feel like Jesus is saying, Give that cross to that guy. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> this is awkward. Illusionist guy thought awkward. No, this is awkward. We've just buried this guy's mother. This guy's 50-some years old. I don't even know this guy. But I knew that I knew that I knew that it was Jesus talking. So this is what I, you know. I was like, hey, come here, can, can I talk to you a second? And he's like, yeah, sure. And we kind of walk over here, this guy and his wife. His wife comes over too, and I'm like, oh, great, I gotta have witnesses, you know? So I'm like, bro, I know this sounds really weird, but I just feel like I'm supposed to give you something. And I took the cross off. I'm not gonna do it right now, get all tangled up, but I took the cross off and I put it around his neck. And I said, I feel like Jesus is telling me to tell you that he's got a plan for you, he's got a purpose for your life, and then he's not done with you. I'm sorry if that's weird. But that's what I'm supposed to say. Bro starts crying. Walks away. I kind of have this awkward goodbye with his wife. I say goodbye to everybody else. I get in my car and I leave. I felt so stupid. I felt about this small. Whatever. But a month later, I get an email from the guy. I'm not going to tell you everything that's said in the email, but in essence, he said, John, the words at my mother's graveside were exactly what God wanted me to hear. I was done with life, done with my marriage, ready to just check out on everything. I'd been away from the church for 20 years. And he went on to say how Jesus was calling him back. You see, when someone knows Jesus, their life's going to change. And not just once. Their life's going to change every day. Because they're going to have a real living, breathing, communicating relationship with Jesus. You know, Scripture says the Lord is spirit. It means if you know Jesus, he lives in you. If he lives in you, he communicates with you. If you really know Jesus, you're going to hear from Jesus. You're going to speak with Jesus. You're not just going to talk about him. You're not just going to sing about him. You're not just going to read about him. You're going to actually have a real, live, living, breathing relationship with him, and he's going to use you to impact other people. That's one of the ways that you know that you know that you know that you know Jesus. Knowing Jesus equals change. There's going to be an internal change. That's where he always starts. When you meet Jesus, he changes you from the inside out. 
The internal change means that the things that motivate you, the things that you love, the things that you're passionate about, the things that you hate, all of that's going to change in an instant. It also means you're going to change externally. You're going to change on the inside. You're going to change on the outside. The way you live your life, the things you do, the things you don't do, they're going to now be motivated by what's on the inside. It's a complete and utter change. And it's the only way to have real life. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I've come that they, may, that they might have life and have it to the full. You know, I think there's a lot of people out there that call themselves Christians, but they're only living half lives. They're not living full lives. They're living half lives. Maybe they said a prayer one time. Maybe they, maybe they go to church a lot. Maybe they, you know, listen to a lot of Christian music. Maybe they just kind of hang around the Christian scene, but they don't know Jesus and they don't have a full life because they don't communicate with Jesus, they don't hear from him. And you know what, if they're really honest, there's been no change. Yeah, there might be a little change on the outside, but there's no real internal change. There's a second group of people. That second group is the crew that they don't know Jesus. They don't really see the need for Jesus. What's the point? Why should I need Jesus? Why do I need Jesus? What's the big deal? I'm a spiritual person, I'm a good person, my life's going along just fine, I don't need Jesus. It, well, you know, if, if Jesus was just about your happiness and you're happy, well, of course you wouldn't think that you'd need Jesus. But here's the problem, is, is what the scriptures teach is that we all have a big issue, we have a problem. That's what I started with is that we're all wicked and there is no hope. The story of the gospel goes all the way back to the beginning when it says in the Garden of Eden, our first parents, Adam and Eve, they were put in this perfect place by a perfect God. They had everything that they could ever want, need, desire. It was all right there. God asked them to obey him by simply don't touch this one tree. Everything else you can have. They're running around naked and unashamed, having a great time. Perfect temperatures like San Diego. I knew all five of the Christians from California made it. That's good. <laughs> Kidding. But it's perfect. It's like San Diego. And, and, and they disobeyed God. They ate from the tree that he told them not to touch. They touched that tree. And that's where Satan, sin, and death invaded our world. That's where all of evil comes from. And in that moment, mankind was forever separated from God. You see, the Bible teaches that God is holy, just, and perfect. He's a holy God. There's no evil in him. He can't even look upon sin. He can't even look upon evil. He is perfect in his character and in his nature. And he's also just, which means God is so good and so perfect and there's so much justice in him that he must punish injustice. He has to. Not because he's a meaner. He has to because he's just. And anyone who's honest knows that the problem with human beings is that we're not perfect. And it's not just the super bad guys that go in and shoot up schools. It's not just evil terrorists that are imperfect. It's you. It's me. It's us. We've all been infected by the first sin of our first parents. Scripture says all of us have fallen short of the glory of God because of our sin. And sin, in the face of a just God, deserves punishment. It deserves death. So if you're one of the people here tonight that you don't know Jesus and you don't think you need to know him, here's the problem. Scripture also teaches that this perfect, holy, and just God will hold all of us accountable. That means whether you believe in God or not, or you believe in your need for Jesus or not, it doesn't matter. One day you'll stand before Jesus and then you'll have to deal with him then. 
Philippians chapter 2 says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That means your knee will bow. It's just a question of when. Will it bow now or will it bow then? And I got a hint for you. It's better that you do it now than to be forced to do it later. You think you don't know Jesus? Or need to know Jesus? But then there's this third group of people, and this is the group of people that I worry about the most. It's a group of people that they're not sure. You guys, I grew up in a Christian home. I'm, I'm the, you know, I, I love my parents. My father was a pastor, you know, my parents were missionaries, and I mean, we were in church every time the church doors were open. I mean, I've been to Sunday school, I've been to Bible school, vacation Bible school, I know the Veggie Tale songs. I, I, I'm old enough to know what flannel boards were. That's the scary thing. I've seen great, you know, Christian production plays. I've seen horrible ones. I've been to the music fest. I get it, okay? I'm what's called a child of the Christian ghetto. And I would guess that many of you are the same way. And you know what one of the problems is with the Christian ghetto? Is, is, is you don't really remember where the change happened. It, 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 it wasn't my parents' fault. It wasn't my church's fault. But for a long time, I remember thinking I was a Christian, then I'd come to one of these, and then I'd think that maybe I wasn't a Christian. And, and it, okay, let's be honest. I became a Christian about 87 times. And usually it went like this. I thought I was a Christian, then I did something bad, and then I felt bad about it, and I thought I had to become a Christian again. So I got saved again, and then I'd go, you know, along the straight and narrow for a while, and then I'd do something bad. I'm sorry, Jesus, I'm probably not even Christian, and i got to start all over. Lord, forgive, you know, I mean, seriously, does anyone, can anyone relate to that? Does anyone come to become a Christian about 87 times, or at least 10, or at least 4, 3? The rest of you don't even want to play along, fine. A lot of us were not sure. I think a lot of us are just not sure. What am I looking for? Well, if knowing Jesus equals change, that means there's going to be something different about you from the inside out. And here's what I think a lot of us do, children of the Christian ghetto. We know what to say to keep mom and dad off our back. We know what to say that will make the youth pastor or the youth workers happy. And so we say those things but we don't really give Jesus our hearts. We don't really get to know him. Because getting to know Jesus isn't just like, hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. Getting to know Jesus involves totally surrendering, totally tapping out your life to him just by the force of his personality, the force of his character, because Jesus is God. You can't be neutral towards Jesus. And, it, and it's weird. It's like the people that know Jesus, they're not neutral towards Jesus. The people outside the church, they're not neutral. They know they don't want him. The people that are neutral towards Jesus, I think, are the vast majority of people that go to church. They're just kind of, hey, they just kind of keep them here. They don't really want to hear from him. They don't really want to communicate with him. They don't want to have awkward graveside moments. They don't want to actually get to know Jesus because it's going to mean they have to change everything. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus says some of the most haunting words in all of Scripture. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me. You guys, I say those words are haunting because did you hear 
the people that, that one day will stand before Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, did we not? And then he says, prophesy, that means preach. Do we not do miracles? Do we not cast out demons? These are people that go to church. These are people that will have gone to the follow conference. These are people that understand what religious activity is. But showing up on a Sunday, singing the songs, kind of knowing a lot about Jesus doesn't cut it. It's not knowing about Jesus, it's do you know him? You know, back in the day, I, I used to speak at a lot of different, you know, Christian schools, and one of the things I would ask them is, is you know, hey, do you know uh, such and such? You know, pick a great, you know, athlete, you know, tell me something about LeBron, you know, and, and it would be like, well, what's his number? And, you know, some kid would be like, I know his number, you know, well, what was his stats this last year? Oh, they knew his stats. What teams he play for? You know, how many championships? Boom, you know. Then we'd mess with the girls, you know, we'd be like, well, hey, tell me who's the, you know, latest chicken, Bridget Jones, whatever, and they know this actress and everything, oh, sorry, uh, who's the latest vampire chick on all the Twilight things, right? Oh, I know all about her, I know who her boyfriend is, and I'm my Facebook friend, bang, 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 you know what I'm saying? Don't act like you don't know. Oh, sorry, Wesleyan Convention. Tell me all Justin Bieber's stats. There's always some screamers when you mention the Bieber. So whether it's LeBron or it's some chick in a vampire movie or Bieber, you can tell me all about it. You know, you, it's, it's, it's all this information, but then I'd play this dirty trick. I'd be like, oh, so you know LeBron. Yeah, you know Bieber. Great. Do you have his phone number? Nope. Can you take me to his house? <laughs> well, no. Can you introduce me to him? I'd like to meet the Biebs got some things I'd like to cover with him. Mostly about not getting songs that stick in my head forever. And the answer is always no. Well, then you don't really know that person, do you? It's the same thing with Jesus. Have you heard from him? Have you talked to him? Can you introduce me to him? Do you have a real living, breathing relationship with him? Has everything changed? See, as a pastor, one, one of my greatest fears is we've got a whole generation in church that they know Jesus' Facebook page, they know his stats, they know his favorite bands, they know a lot of information about him, but they don't know him. And even more frightening, according to Matthew 7, he doesn't know them. Really? You prophesied, you cast out demons, you did miracles. Away from me, I never knew you. If you're a Christian, you know Jesus. If you know Jesus, that equals change. What does your life look like? Has there been a change? How do you know if you've changed? An easy thing to know is, well, what do you feel about sin? How do you feel about sin? Do you enjoy sin? Sorry, I didn't mean to go so aggressive and talk about sin, but let's be honest. I mean, we know what sin is. Disobeying God, the things that God doesn't want us to do, evil, the, the evil things that we do. Now, don't get me wrong. Someone that knows Jesus doesn't necessarily not sin. Because we're still human beings. We're fallen. I'm fallen. You're fallen. We're all wicked. The good news is, is I don't have to be perfect. I have Jesus. Because I have Jesus, now I'm perfect. If you know Jesus, 
that means you believe in the power of the cross. You believe in what Jesus did on the cross, namely that he died, he shed his blood as a perfect sacrifice so you and I don't have to be perfect. So that all my sin of yesterday, today, and forever is paid for. And all the sin of the world, for those who trust and believe in the name of Jesus, we can be saved. So now when God looks down and, and he looks at me, or he looks at you, if you know Jesus, he sees Jesus. That's the great news of the gospel. And it doesn't mean that I won't sin, but it does mean this. It means that I can't enjoy sin anymore. <laughs> Think about that. See, before I became a Christian, sin was fun. Sin paid off. Now that I'm a Christian, I can't enjoy sin. It doesn't have the same payoff. That's called conviction. Because now that I know Jesus and I've been changed on the inside, I don't want to sin. So when I do sin, I feel bad about it because it interferes in my relationship with Jesus. And I want to correct it. I want to make it right. So that's why I said, you want to know, have you changed? Do you still enjoy sin? So in other words, do you call yourself a Christian, but you know what? You just live like everyone else in the world and it doesn't really bother you? If it doesn't bother you, I think that's a clue that you probably don't know Jesus. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but I am trying to step on your toes. And if I step on your toes and hurt your feelings, so be it. I'm more afraid of Jesus than I am of you. Does your sin bother you? Have you resisted the urge to tap out, to surrender everything to Jesus? You guys know what I mean when I say tap out? You guys understand what I mean, tap out? You ever seen the ultimate fighting? And some guy's got like his hip out of joint and over here he's bleeding from every orifice in his body and you know the referee and he's like oh I can't stand any more pain and finally right before just like milliseconds before he dies one MMA guy he he taps out and then they go the fight's over and then you know they're beating their brains out and then right before one of them has their hand raised they all hug each other I love you man thanks for not killing me Someone that's really a Christian, someone that really knows Jesus has tapped out to Jesus. That means said, my whole life belongs to you. I'm not going to resist the change that you want to do. And I think some of us, we've been resisting change for too long. You're not even sure why you're here, but now it's starting to become clear right in these minutes right here that deep inside you want to change. You want him to change you. You want to be different from the inside out. And you've been trying for a long time to change everything on the outside, but it doesn't work that way because all that stuff on the outside, all it is is religious activity. It's religion and religious people are the worst. They're the people that killed Jesus. Because it's all smoke and mirrors. It's all camo. It's all on the outside. He wants to meet you for you to get to know him, and you're going to change from here so then the stuff on the outside happens naturally. Do you know Jesus is the question. Do you want to know Jesus is the question. Do you want to be different? Do you want to change? For some of us, it could start tonight right at the beginning of the conference. And I'm just going to tell you, it'll make the rest of the conference make a lot more sense if you take care of business right now. And I believe for some of you, it's been a long time coming. Because you've been in that category of I'm not really sure. Or you know what? I've been playing the game, but tonight I want to make certain. So this is what we're going to do. I want you to bow your heads. I don't want you to mess with anybody. We're not going to take a long time. But I want you to bow your heads. I want you to close your eyes. Even if you're really not into this, just close your eyes. Just, just give us the respect and the people around you. Don't mess with anybody. Don't talk to anybody. Don't move around. Just, I just want to create a space. And I want to ask you this question. What's God saying to you What's he saying?
If you're not sure, just ask him, God, what are you saying to me? And listen. What's God saying and what are you going to do about it? If tonight's the night that you'd like to know for sure, that you'd like to be able to point to December 28th, 2012, and say that was the night that I met Jesus and everything changed. I don't know who you were before tonight. We don't even care. But with every head bowed and every eyes closed, if tonight's the night that you wanna say, you know what, I wanna know Jesus, and I want to know for certain. I want everything to change from the inside out. If that's you and you know he's talking to you, we're not going to make it happen. We're not going to tell any stories to make you cry. But if you know that that's you and you want to be sure, I want you to stand up. Don't look around to see who else is standing up. Awesome. You want to know that you know that you know. You don't want to stand before God someday and have him say, I never knew you. I never really knew you. You hung out a lot at my house, but you were just kind of a groupie. I, I never really had a living, breathing relationship. Come on, five more seconds. I know you're out there, and you desperately want to. Five, four, three, two, ah, yeah, one. Stay standing. Stay standing. We're not going to make it super easy because we want it to be real. Wow, man, I'm so proud of you guys. Just stay standing right there. Now, in a second, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But if you're a guy like I was, you're the guy that said, I'll say the prayer, but stay seated. That doesn't work. You don't get to be seated and say the prayer. So we're going to go into overtime because I want these people to get to know. They're going to get to know Jesus. They're going to. They're going to ask him to change everything. You can't ask him to change everything by sitting there and not tapping out. Part of the tapping out is standing up. If you can't stand up at a conference surrounded by Christians, goodness sakes, how can you stand a chance out there? So over time, five more seconds, you, you've been planning on sitting and saying the prayer, but you're going to stand with these brave ones. Five, four, three, yes. Two, one, yes, you, I knew you were there. God is the best. Those of you that are standing, I just want you to pray out loud. You can whisper, you don't have to yell it, don't be silly or anything like this. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. It says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. That's pretty simple. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. So just in your own words, I, I, I just say something like, Jesus, I believe that you are God. I believe that you're the son of God. Just say it, something like that out loud. God, I believe that you can save me from my sins. God, please forgive me of my sin and come into my life. God, I want you to change me from the inside out. God, I want to know you. And I want you to know me. Say it right out loud. 
God, I surrender my life to you. God, I'm yours. Amen. Stay standing. Those of you that are seated. For real? For real? For real? Now here's the plan. Here's the plan. You've been this brave. Stay brave. Stay courageous. Are you kidding? Your students. I, I didn't have the courage to do what you did when I was here. You just stood up in front of all these people. I'm so proud of you. Don't worry about them. Who cares? I don't care if your girlfriend's still sitting down or your bro, whatever. Who cares about that guy? It's Jesus that we care about right now. Those of you that are standing behind those bleachers, right back there, there's some tables. There's some people that just want to talk with you. They don't have little white shirts and little ties. They're not going to come to your house on a bicycle. Okay? There's not Kool-Aid that's going to make you, like, possess. It's nothing weird, okay? They're just people that know Jesus, and they want to help you because right now is a pretty important time. So those of you that are standing, I just want you right now, no one else move, just the people that are standing. We're, we're going to stay seated until you're out and you're walking that way. Go. Just go. Just right behind those bleachers right there. Just go right now. Everybody else, let's cheer for them again because we're so proud of them. We're going to thank God right now. Let's pray. Those of you that are seated, if you'll stand with me. We'll think we're going to worship in a second, but let's pray first. And if you're comfortable, you know, it said that... Uh, that uh, it says in scripture that we're supposed to lift holy hands to heaven. And if you're fired up about that, put your hands up in the air. And if you're like, that's too weird, that's okay too. God in heaven, we thank you that you're a real God. Jesus, we thank you that you love us so much that you died for us, that you loved us so much that you came to be like us, that you came in flesh and bone, that you understood temptation. God, I thank you that you're real today and that you're so generous that you Put your spirit within us. God, I pray for those people here tonight that know you, that we would continue to live hating sin, loving our neighbor, loving you, surrendering every day, every moment, every bit of our lives to you. God, for those people that are here tonight that don't know you and don't know what to do with you, God, I pray that the hound of heaven would hound them to the very ends of the earth. God, that they would surrender in this life so they don't have to surrender in the next and face what's in store for those who reject your name. God, I thank you for the victory that you've done here tonight. We love you, Jesus, and we celebrate you tonight. It's in your strong name, our great God and King, that we offer up this praise and this thanks.